All right, welcome everyone to lecture, lecture 12. Just shared you with the uh, slides today. Just one second to connect my iPad. All right, I oh, actually forgot to add Transformer 2 and language model. Actually, I'm going to add that. Okay, now, as always, quiz time. So, just one second. Oh, shoot, my bad. Okay, three minutes.
All right. So, as always, a few announcements first. Assignment two is due today, but you can use your no penalty late days. Assignment three will be up next Wednesday and it will be due in two weeks. So we're a bit in a tight schedule, but don't worry about it too much because three and four will be relatively easy compared to one and two. I think you put a lot of time on one and two. And next Wednesday is the first discussion session reminder of two in total. And remember that your grade will be 80% from either assignments or um, assignments. So four assignments or two assignments plus the final projects. And the 10% comes from your attendance and 10% comes from the discussion. We have two discussions, one in next week and the other in the end of the semester. So please make sure to come to the class and please let head TA know if you can't. And we'll see what we can do about it to make up for it. I got a chat. Oh yeah, so regarding the question for the late days, can we use two sequentially or only at once? No, not at once. You can basically use it I mean, you can you can distribute it however you want. So maybe you want to use three days for the first assignment, two days for the second assignment, and the rest of the two day, the rest two days in the third assignment, and so on. So it's your choice. Okay. So let's begin first with uh, today's. I mean, last lecture recap. So we now finally started transformer. And what is transformer again? So, well, I, I believe that many of you have heard of it anyways. So I'll just try to, but still I think some of you haven't, right? So I'll try to um, give you um, overview description again. I'm being, I think redundant with the last lecture, of course, because this is a recap, but so transformer, you can think of transformer as a basically something that has a same input and output structure as LSTM layer. So in LSTM, you put a series of embeddings, word embeddings into the LSTM, and then the output will be also a series of embedding, usually in the same dimension. But then, so you can think of this as X being X being input. You have a T being these lengths of the sequence and the D being the dimension. The L, what LSTM does is that this LSTM maps the X to Y where Y is also T times D. And that was just LSTM. And you basically use that for classification, either token level or sentence level, right? But then encoder decoder, what it can do is you have a same X. So you have same X here. And you also have Y, which can be um, same dimension for the, um, the hidden state size, but then now you can have a different length for the output. So T can be something other than L. I mean, L can be something other than T. And that's the beauty of the SIG to SIG or encoder out, uh, decoder model because you can basically map an arbitrary length sequence to an arbitrary length output. And Transformer basically is for this encoder decoder. It replaces encoder decoder. But then it's still, transformer is referring to the entire thing that does this uh, X to Y mapping in the, um, so transformer lies here. Okay. 
But then when people say they use transformer, they sometimes mean that they only use the encoder side of the transformer or they only use the decoder side of the transformer, depending on their use case. For instance, if you're only doing classification, then you, you might don't you, you might not need to need actually use the decoder. You just need to use the encoder. So in that case, then you only use the encoder side. And we'll see soon that if you're actually creating a language model, then you only need to use the decoder side. So, and of course, if you're just doing a sequence to sequence, then you will use the entire transformer. So this is to make sure that um, you don't get confused with uh, when people say we use transformer, they usually mean either encoder side or decoder side, or they could mean they use the entire transformer, which is the sequence to sequence. And we, we actually discussed that what was special about transformer. Well, compared to encoder decoder, for instance, with, that uses LSTM, it, transformer doesn't have any RNNs, which means it doesn't have any uh, positional, I mean, it doesn't have any sequential dependency, at least on the input side. We'll see today that the, it's actually a bit different on the decoder side. Um, but then encoder side, at least it's, it's completely paralyzable. Decoder actually is not. And it only uses self-attention, but then it's a bit um, misleading because uh, self-attention is, uh, well, I said that this is not correct. I'm sorry that I didn't fix that because you, you use a self-attention on the encoder side, but then on the decoder side, you actually have a, um, attention from the encoder to decoder. We'll cover that today. And it proposed multi-head attention. So we're gonna see that today too. And it has a unidirectional attention on the decoding. So it's a bit, how the attention works is a bit different on the decoder side. And basically all these characteristics enable the model to be scaled up and also simplified, which lets us to actually um, move from the data uh, model centric paradigm to more of a data centric paradigm or research. So we, in the last class, we delved into the self-attention equation, which is basically corresponding to um, this part. And after you perform this part, actually, it's pretty uh, straightforward. After you perform the attention, you just have a residual connection with the, some normalization. This is actually a uh, layer norm. And adding is just add. So basically adding what it does is that it adds the um, input of this attention to the output of the attention. So it basically there's a connection from the input to the output. This helps the model to train better in many cases. And after that, you have this uh, feed forward, which is just a linear mapping. And then you have another add and norm. And it's pretty simple network, right? And then you consider this to be a one attention block Right. And then you basically stack this like six times, 12 times, 24 times, or even more uh, for the encoder side. Then what, what comes out of this encoder? Well, the exactly if the X was T by D, then what comes out of the encoder will be just T by D as well. So that's really great, right? Because you have a uh, same input and output dimensions. It's very easy to operate with it. And then this H is now used as the um, basically same thing as what you would, how you would use the output of the encoder in the canonical encoder decoder with LSTMs and you perform the attention on it and then you decode one token at a time. You can think of this diagram as a one token at a time decoding. And then basically you uses the H as the, what you're attending on and then you, actually have this connection in the second attention. So in the decoder side, it's a bit different because you have a, first of all, same kind of attention with masking. We're gonna cover that today soon. Um, then it doesn't go to fit forward right away, but it passes through this, what's called um, attention from encoder to decoder. And then you have another add and norm. And then finally you have feed forward network with add and norm again. And you basically stack this in the same number of layers to get 
the next token prediction. So now let's see how the attention works. We covered this last lecture. So, well, so when we're doing attention, you remember that really the important thing is how we define the affinity or similarity between two vectors. That's, that's the whole point of attention, right? To see, to determine where you want to attend on. So people usually call it affinity. You can think of this as a synonym to similarity. And then um, we saw that in the original Barano et al. 2015 paper, the affinity score was computed by the dot product between, this is a weight, this is a weight, train of weight. And then you basically have this linear transformation with the um, two vectors that you're comparing with. So it's basically, this is a, vector one and vector two. You can think of as also one of them being basically actually um, query vector and this being the key vector because you're attending from SI minus one to HJ in the encoder decoder. Remember that the H was the whatever comes out of the encoder side. SI minus one is the current decoder's hidden state. Then you basically do linear transformation and then you perform 10H. So this will be actually some vector, right? And then you dot product this with the another weight to get a scale value. So this will be scale value, right? This entire thing is just scalar. And this is basically affinity between SI minus one and HA. And we, um, discussed that this is not efficient because in order to compute this in parallel, you have to um, actually create a matrix that's very large. So um, suppose that because this HJ, so I think it's worth mentioning again. So S I minus one and HJ, they're both just D dimensional vector, but then you can now define um, for instance, you can define H, you can, if you want to compute the attention over multiple different vectors so that you want to actually compute this, um, I would say attention matrix between the, all the SIs and all the HJs, then basically you want to actually first create a matrix S comma H, which is, um, now you have a, well, S will be different size. It can be different size, I mean, so I'll actually do the other way. So um, let's say that uh, HJ is um, source sentence. So we use T for that. And then you can say that S is now L times T. So I think, I assume that T equal to L in the last lecture, but just to make, um, you know, make this more, I would say, um, mathematically correct, there they can be different. Then what you need to actually store in your GPU to parallelize this computation is that you have to compute H prime, which is basically um, L times T times D. And then you have to also compute S prime, which is also L times T times D. How do you create that? Well, you basically just stack the same H L times for H prime, and you stack the same S prime T times for um, S prime. But then of course, um, you, when you're stacking it, you're stacking on different dimension. In H prime, you're stacking on the first dimension Whereas in the S prime, you're stacking on the second dimension. But after that, basically then you can um, compute this in parallel, but this is very large number. Usually this is very large number. That's why this formulation is GPU memory inefficient. Whereas Long et al. Uh, 2015, which was proposed in the same year. Well, this is very convenient because if we want to do this the same thing, well, we have a same, 
um, no case here. Let's say that uh, source is S, right? So A, we have different notation in long and all. That's why we're um, using different notations here. So, but then you know that H here, HS is equivalent to H in the previous slide. And then uh, HT is equivalent to the S in the previous slide. Um, so HS is now same T, T by D matrix and HD, HT is also L by T matrix. But then the beauty of this, um, this way of uh, computing the if affinity is that if you want to compute this at once, then what you can just do is you can just compute um, So you basically have uh, scores is equal to HT, W, A, H, S transpose, where um, W, A is um, D by D matrix. And you know that, of course, this will mat have a matching dimensions because uh, it's a T by D. Um, D by D and D by T transpose, right? So you get canceled out everything. And what remains is just T by T matrix, right? But in that case, then actually my bad, uh, not T by T, okay. Um, because we're transposing the HS here. So HS is T, but then this should be L. So we have L by T matrix. And what does this L by T matrix indicate? Well, um, so this matrix, if you um, actually query this, you, you extract a spe specific value in this matrix, for instance, I comma J, um, then um, that score will be, well, referring to the, how similar the the i vector in the um, h t the target and j vector in h s the source. Okay, I'll just write that affinity between. Um, I vector of, um, well, HT. Well, I mean, which is just HT, right? Small HT, I'll just write that way. Uh, wait, no, my bad. There is no um, HT of I and HS of J. Okay, so, and then after, so, but then um, also I wanted to point out that that's one way to compute it, but then uh, there, it's, there's another way to define the weight or WA. So um, in, in, um, in the uh, in transformer, instead of um, defining the weight, just one weight between the, the, the key and query vectors or the source and target vectors, what they did is that they instead uh, because they're performing the self-attention in, in, uh, in uh, typical cases, what they do is, um, because if you're performing self-attention, then this HS and HT will be the same, right? So what they did is that given H, you basically compute um, H, W, K, H, W, Q, and H, W, V. So same age, but then different weights, W, K, Q, B, where um, W, K, W, Q, W, V, R, are all in the uh, D by D matrix. Okay. All right, so that's great. 
And then after that, because we are the the attention is defined as the how the affinity between the key and query, which is basically equivalent to um, you know, I mean not equivalent to, but basically in this case, if you're just doing the from the quarter to from the quarter to encoder attention, then in that case, then the query will be the decoder because you're querying from the decoder side on the keys. Where the attention is happening actually is basically the keys, which is the encoder side. When if you're performing self attention, then of course you're just uh, your self is key and also query. But uh, you compute the um, affinity scores by scores is equal to. So we will call this K, okay, and this will Q, and this will call V. So that's actually corresponding to these. Then scores is you multiply the K with Q. So it's, I mean, the convention I think was, which way was it? Yeah, Q was first. I mean, it doesn't matter, but then scores is that Q, K, T, which is equivalent to H, W, Q, and W, K, transpose, and H, T. And because this is trainable, right? So then we know that um, this can be just uh, replaced with the uh, uh, one W in, uh, in theory. Of course, we don't do that in practice, but so um, it's basically equivalent to what we're talking here, right? And then after you obtain these scores, you will have to apply what softmax. But also we discussed that we also divide this by square root dk. Why? Because this will help us to uh, basically soften the attention. Without this, the attention will be very spiky. It will have a very, um, very few high values and all other values will be very close to zero. But then we make it, less spiky, which make the model more differentiable and easier to train. And then we have to apply softmax in order to make this into attention. And then we perform the attention, which was, you know, this, this thing you remember, right? We perform the attention in parallel by just multiplying this attention weight matrix to the value matrix. And this will be the ending, the result of this attention will be just um, T by D matrix. So we remember that the also V is T by D matrix. So apparently um, dimension wise, we're mapping same size matrix to same size matrix. And that's very beautiful, right? Okay, so there was a very long recap. I did a long recap because today's lecture will be entirely depend on this recap. So I'm going to close the quiz now. Okay, so I'm going to first save it. Okay, so let's share it. All right, so quiz number one, true or false, position inquiry and transformer allows the model to be aware of the position of the words. This is true, right? That's exactly the purpose of the um, position encoder, which also called usually PE, um, which I think most people got right. Number two, true or false, Transformer only performs self-attention on the encoder side and does not perform attention from the encoder to decoder. This is false. Why? If you see the diagram again, there is a attention happening from encoder to decoder, right? Uh, 
And lastly, true or false, a generic purpose model such as transformer allows us to move from data-centric research to model-centric research. It's the other way, right? We, um, before transformer, people were focusing a lot on the model, how to design the models. But then um, because now these um, transformers or these models can be considered as like uh, one model to, you know, be used at all applications, then you don't have to really develop new, new models. It's more of a, what kind of data you feed into the model and then how you train it. So we become more data centric from model centric. So it's the other way actually. So this is false, which is good because I think most people got it right. Okay. I'll close this. All right. So I'm gonna spend next 10 minutes on the, um, uh, some of the, uh, first of all, efficiency discussions. So here's a really important distinction between self-attention or the attention we perform compared to the recurrent neural network. Well, uh, even just not considering the fact that attention is usually more powerful in terms of uh, uh, the function it can model, but then even in terms of the efficiency, attention is better than recurrent. And actually, it's important to point this out because when the transformer first came up at, fir uh, at first, um, transformer was not, um, I would say, was not uh, the gap between the LSTM based uh, neural net, uh, machine translation model and the transformer based machine translation model when it first came out was not too big. So that was one reason why they were talking a lot about the efficiency as well, which is a big, big advantage too, right? If those models are, have a similar accuracy, but then later it, well, it turned out that actually transformer is working better than recurrent neural network in terms of accuracy too. And when we got to, when we got to that point, then it was clear that, well, self-attention is better than RNN in every aspect, right? Efficiency and also um, the accuracy. So that was clear that the transformer will be replacing RNNs entirely. And it's also simpler too. You don't have to worry about anything else than just stacking up the attention modules. Okay, so here the N is, N is basically the length. So we use T up to now, but N is length and D is the uh, same thing, right? Hidden size. Okay, so first of all, self-attention um, complexity per layer is n squared times d. Why is that? So we can actually prove this pretty easily because remember that the most computation happens where? Here, right? This is the first computation actually. Uh, I'll just copy this and then write it here because I think it's confusing to go back and forth. Um, so it was QK transpose, right? So QKB is equal to QKT over D V, right? And the most computations happen here and here. I mean, to be more exact, um, between um, this softmax and these two, right? So what is the time complex of QKT? So O of uh, computing QKT is equal to, actually it's not a <laughs> mathematically good way to write, so QKT, the time complexity is, well, both are T by um, D matrix. And what is the time complexity of multiplying um, T by D to D by T? It's exactly T times D squared. And how about the, um, the result of softmax and V? Well, that's actually, Let's, let's call this A, then A is, uh, it's actually T, 
actually, I'm not going to use T, I'm sorry. It should be L. I mean, we used N, right? So to avoid confusion, M by D and D by N. In that case, then it's N times D times N. That's the uh, how matrix time complexity works. Always the first and middle and this uh, last. How about AV then? AV is M by N, uh, M by N matrix A is, and V is, um, wait, M by D, right? So then what is this uh, time complexity? Oh, so I'm sorry, <laughs> this is my bad. So, okay, it's not N, n d squared, so n times d times n, right? So I, I said I said this, but then I wrote it wrong. So n times whatever they share, and then n. So it should be um, n times d times n, which is n squared d. And how about a v? This is also n times n times d. So this is all again n squared d. So both computations apparently mostly. Um, what do you call, um, have uh, n squared d op operations. And we also have the feed for network that comes after that. And what is that operation um, time complexity? Well, we know that V is n times d and feed for will be d by d. So it's it basically that will be um, multiplying m by d to D by D, right? Which is actually, if you think about that, um, wait, uh, what was I gonna say? Um, the, um, so I'm actually, what was I gonna say? Just, just one second, please. Okay, so I think I'll have to double check this because actually if you multiply n, n, n by d and d by d, then it will be nd square. And I think um, this table was referring to just the um, attention part without the feed forward part. So um, I'll come back to that later, but then uh, let's not talk about the feed forward for now, but uh, what's really important is the attention at this point. So you, may, you now agree that the, at least the attention part up to now is n square d, right? And recurrent is n time d square because, well, it's just basically uh, what they do is um, you apply each recurrent neural net with um, uh, d by d matrix. And then f, as soon as you perform that, you just um, go to the next time step. So it just becomes n, n time d square, right? Because in RNNs, um, what happens is you have a, I'm gonna actually show you that. So in the in the uh, typical RNNs, HT is B, right? And then um well, what is this operation? This operation will be, um, this is uh, d by d and it's d by one. So this is just a um, d square operation. And this is a, also d square operation. So both are just O of d square. And you have to repeat this n times because um, you have a length n um, sentence, right? So that's why this will be uh, O of uh, 
and d square. Okay, so that's up to here. Okay, so we're gonna we're not gonna actually go into convolution too much, but then you can think of this as uh, it becomes actually a bit more computationally heavy than recurrent because there is something called um, kernel size. And self-attention restricted just means that if you just perform the self-attention on um, certain length, then you don't have to actually attend on the entire end, but just like uh, nearby. Or of course, you might, when you're doing these from decoder to encoder, then it's actually um, and at n squared, but it will be n times r, where in that case, r will be the encoder's length. But anyways, um, so that's good. So we're going to have a short break until um, until 45, and then we're going to come back and cover the rest of today's lecture.
Okay, welcome back. All right, so let's go really, let's try to finish this really quickly. And so so one, one thing to note is that in self-attention, the this entire operation can be computed with just a few matrix multiplications that does not depend on the the length of the input. So that's why it means that the sequential operation is O1. And that means usually that you can leverage GPU, which is very good at parallel, parallel, parallel computing, then you can be really com computed really fast compared to RNN, for instance, we actually require to um, compute the previous time steps output to compute the next time step. So O1 is better than O1, ON. This is a, the lower the better. But of course, self-attention has also um, the weakness or disadvantage compared to RNN, which is that the, the path length, which is, well, so what, it's talk, what's, what uh, it means about the path lengths is that um, here, how much, uh, how much your input can, can depend on the um, well the previous token. So uh, because if you just apply RNA uh, the attention once, then your computation dependency is only one layer, right? You can have uh, several de uh, uh, multiple dependencies. That's actually corresponding to maximum path lengths, and this is important because if you want to model some recurrent relationship in the input, then that means that recurrent relationship is basically the, the current token depends on the previous token and previous token depends on the token before, right? So in that case, the, the higher the path length, the better, but then the self-attention, just one layer only has one path length. That's the, the, uh, the big disadvantage of the uh, self-attention compared to RNNs, which just one layer, you can have a maximum um, n, a length of n dependency. So uh, you can now see that the convolutional is log kn because, uh, well, if you have a kernel size of k, then let's say then, uh, how, do, how do you actually interpret this? Because you you basically you can think of this as a, you will need only low k, k of n to achieve a full full length dependency. Whereas in self attention, if you have a ten layers, then you can only have a um, ten recurrent dependency. You cannot have more than that. Recurrent neural network, you don't even need like n. You only need one to actually achieve that. Okay. So, the, so the, 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 the takeaway is that if you want to model really highly recurrent relationship, then you will need a lot of layers for self-attention. In recurrent neural network, you might not need that many layers. Convolutional, it's between self-attention and recurrent because um, it has some, you can actually look at the nearby tokens which is within the length of K so that you actually can uh, look at all the tokens within the, with the layers number, number of layers equal to log K of N. And um, you can think of the same thing for the self-attention restricted where you have only about restricted uh, window of uh, your, um, what you're looking at. Okay, so that's it. And then there's really one important thing to talk about um, what's different about transformer. You don't actually end here uh, that you just have, uh, it's not that you have, have only one attention head or one attention, one, uh, one, one uh, step of attention. Because single attention can only focus on one part of the sequence, right? So if you just perform uh, one attention per layer, then basically for every attention, you're only focusing on one part of the sequence. What if you want to model to focus on multiple parts of the sequence? In that case, we just do multi-head attention. So what does that mean? In practice, that means instead of uh, when you're computing the, um, the scale dot product attention, 
which is remember this right the just softmax of uh, qkt over d and then you multiply that by v so instead of using this on the just one q one k and one v basically you have a um, you can think of this as a, you have a q1 q2 k1 k2 and v1 and v2 up to uh, q over uh, let's use um, variable h same here so you have a h different query key and uh, v uh, matrices and then you just perform the attention for each hat so you basically perform the attention with uh, this and this and this and each attention will result in attention matrix of what real number of uh, um, n being the length of the sequence and times t and you basically have a h real number, I mean, H matrix of N by D, right, in this case. But of course, if you do that, then there's one, um, uh, what would I say, uh, bad thing, because in that case, then if you just concatenate them, well, um, that will be too large, because if you just concatenate the results of this, then it will be, uh, the entire thing will be what? N times, HD, right? And HD will be much bigger than D. And this is not good in many uh, aspects. One, one number one is that you're not getting the same size of a uh, same size model, I mean, same size input and output, same uh, input and output dimensions. But also, it's not good in that the, the computation will be too large. So instead of um, trying to in order to avoid having such large output matrix, what they do is instead of uh, mapping this, um, instead of having Q, K, V with the size of M by D dimensions, they instead define the D H to be, the basically dimension of hat to be, is basically D divided by H. So that when you concatenate them, then they just become M, M by D matrix instead of M by H times D matrix. Of course, they usually make this div, uh, exactly divisible. So for instance, um, if D is equal to 5, 12, H can be something like um, 16. Then D, H will be um, just simply uh, 32, right? That will be one example of defining D, H, and D. But, but just basically just you apply the attention in multiple parallel ways, and then just concatenate them again. Then the output of the concatenation will be just simply um, same size again from the input, which is um, n by d. And then you just do the same linear mapping as you would do if you did, as if you didn't do any of this multi head attention. But you call this each a head, so this have multiple heads, so that's why it's multi head attention. And this enables us to model a complex relationship with relatively few layers. That's the, the ben, uh, biggest benefit. So here it comes, right? Um, yeah, so more concretely, when you want to compute multi-head between QKV, it's, well, actually here, the QKV are all actually the same uh, matrix, in fact. So um, it's there, it was actually a bit confusing whether you define Q to be the, um, matrix that's after you apply this Ws or before Ws. There's some confusion, but in the paper, they use QKV um, before the, applying these Ws. And you uh, actually apply Ws and this become all different. But then if you look at the code, you will see that actually QKV are all H. So when they are actually writing this code, what they just do is um, have multi add and then just H, H, and H. But the QKB is referring to uh, what role each vector will be. 
And this is just talking about the encoder side, right? So if you actually do um, from decoder to encoder, then this will be different. In that case, then the uh, value and the key will be H, but then query will not be H, but this will be rather um, some vector on the decoder side. We can call it maybe S. That'll be decoder side. Okay, just to make sure. So this is encoder and decoder side, it will be And then um, you apply this WI. So what they do is that instead of uh, applying this um, or computing this uh, Q1, Q2, QH independently, in that case, then you will have to do linear mapping uh, H times. More efficient way is that uh, you still stick with the uh, WI being, oh, that's wrong. My pen is not working, just one second. So you still have a, there we go. You still have a Q, K, V being here. Um, M by D. And then W, I, Q uh, are all W, I, V d by d. So after you compute the, um, well, not wi, I'm sorry, wq. So after you compute that, then you now obtain um, qwq, which is um, m by d matrix. And then after you computed this, you divide this into um, h, matrices. So you basically transform this into M by H by D over H. And you can just do this by reshaping the matrix, right? And then you just divide this into now um, H times M by the H matrix. And basically this will be um, uh, each head, corresponding each head basically, right? So that's how you perform the um, attention um, in practice for the computational efficiency, but mathematically they actually did this independently because um, functionally they're equivalent. In math, 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 mathematic, mathematically, they won't care about how to optimize the um, parallelism, right? And skip connection and feed four is pretty straightforward, right? Just you just do um, feed four is just very simple. Uh, it's actually two layer. Um, I mean, it's a two layer multi, uh, MLP, multi layer perceptron, with uh, um, ReLU. This is ReLU, right? But actually, um, later, people used more advanced ones like Jalu, which is a bit uh, softened version of the value. And then, so they have a, a one linear mapping and value and another linear mapping. It's very familiar probably with you already when you're doing the classification, right? And one important thing about positional encoding. So if you just use self-attention, every token is position independent which is not a good thing for um, language because token is defined by where it is with respect to other tokens. So this means that the model cannot differentiate between um, like uh, tokens that are in different positions or in other words, even if the input words are completely randomly shuffled, the model will be behaving exactly the same if we um, do not have, um, if we just use self-attention which doesn't make sense, right? Because um, the meaning can entirely change. Like if you say, if A uh, love B, that's different from B loving A, right? But then that will be just exactly um, same 
from the model's perspective, if you cannot um, make the token position dependent. So in order to make token position dependent, transformer uses position encoder that gets added to the word embedding. Actually, this was originally introduced in the Sukbatar et al. 2015, which is about uh, memory network. And to and um, memory network. But then um, they in, in, back then they didn't use the sinusoidal um, encoder. They actually used a more of a, a linear, piecewise linear encoder. But then in transformer, they instead used the, this um, sinusoidal encoder that will be just having a, something like waves for different dimensions. So if this is like dimension one, then different dimension two will have a, a bit different phase and also different, um, well, it'll be like something like, for instance, maybe starting here um, and maybe another is like that. So um, the point is that you basically have a unique position vector for each position that um, the model, if it's learned well, then it will be able to differentiate between tokens in different positions because they have a different position encoding vectors, right? Um, although it's model's job to actually understand what that means. And in fact, it does well. But then in, in practice, the sinusoidal position encoder is not used a lot these days because people found that in practice, um, it's easier to train and also it's more practical to actually just train the model with position encoder, position embedding being directly trainable than making it something like this. What's the advantage of this compared to the position embedding? Well, sinusoidal embedding is good in that it, it can generate different vectors for arbitrary length, uh, whether it's a 512, 1024, or it can be much longer, it will be still, you can still generate such vector because you know this sinusoidal vector will never end. But in practice, that's not really important anyways, because, because models will not work uh, with token uh, with uh, input lengths bigger than some number. Like for instance, if it's bigger than 1024, it won't work anyways, because it hasn't seen any input with such uh, length anyways. So that's why in practice, people don't use sinusoidal embedding a lot. But still, it's theoret theoretically, it's actually generalizable to arbitrary length input. And um, also uh, let's talk about the attention and decoder. So attention and decoder, as I said in the earlier slide, has a one additional layer for accessing the encoder outputs. And the only difference is that when you're uh, computing this um, for this layer, computing this um, attention and QKV, this is just You look at the source sentence and then, oh, okay. Suppose that then, let's say this part so use blue. This part, this, this matrix is um, suppose uh, S and this matrix is H. Then when you're performing attention in the encoder side, I, I think I said that already, but I'll write this again here. Encoder side, you will perform attention of uh, H, 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 because it's entirely self-attention. But then, um, and then in the decoder, actually um, the first layer, it's same too. You just perform S, S, S. But then in the decoder, uh, second attention is your Q, Q uh, your actually um, K and B becomes different. Your Q is still S, but then your K and V is coming from H. 
that's the, uh, the important difference between the inquiry side and the core side. But the, other than that, it's exactly the same in terms of the, uh, and also the, uh, I'll have to talk about the attention mask, which is another difference. So there are two differences. One is that you have one attention layer to look at the inquiry side. And number two is that because you're decoding, you don't want to look what's ahead of you, or you don't want, when you're trying to predict the current token, you should not be able to look at what's ahead of your um, uh, ahead of the current token time step. Although during training, you're assuming that because we uh, saw this in the encoder decoder, we're assuming that the um, decoder side, the input will be shifted ground truth output, and the output will be non-shifted ground truth output, so that every time step you try to predict the uh, next token, next ground to a token with teacher forcing. But then in LSTM, that was fine because LSTM only can refer to the previous token. So there is a very strict um, forward dependency or backward dependency to be more exact. But in transform, because we are applying the attention on the every token, you can, you can, look, you can pick into the output, the for future output, which will be cheating. So what transformer does is that they introduce uh, what's called attention mask. And this attention mask basically forces the attention weights to be zero for the tokens that's ahead of you. How do you do that? Well, instead of actually forcing that to be zero after, um, wait, computing a softmax, which is not ideal because if you compute softmax, then your summation will be one. And if you zero those values, then your summation will not be one anymore, but you want your softmax value to be zero, a one. So what actually they do is that in order to introduce mask in the softmax, they actually add really large negative number to the logits of softmax, or in other words, when you're computing um, softmax, you perform this QKT over squared D and you plus mask here where mask of I, I over J value is um, negative one E one to the uh, 10 to the power nine or really large number negative If what? If, because um, we don't want to look ahead, I is bigger than J. Or it could be the other word, or the, the other way, depending on how, which, which one is first, whether you're, um, in this case, actually, um, uh, the I is the query and then the J is the uh, key. So it is correct that you can, your query cannot be, query index, your key index cannot be bigger than I, right? So uh, you don't want the K index to be bigger than I. So if K is bigger than I, then your mask should be, uh, not K, I'm sorry, J. J is bigger than I, then your mask should be a really large negative number, but zero otherwise. Okay. All right. And there are some other details like the transformer was trained on 4.5 million sentence pairs of English and German and was tokenized with the bi pair encoding. We briefly discussed this in early um, lectures, data driven tokenization. And there was a dropout of a P equal to 0 0.1 at the output of each sub layer. And also 0 0.1 after summation of word embedding and position encoding. So, uh, if you look at um, the diagram, then the the dropout of a uh, output of each sub layer will be what? Well, this is sub layer. This is sub layer, and this is sub. And this entire thing is layer. So, um, the dropout was applied here. Drop out, drop out, drop out, drop out, and drop out. And then 
after a summation of word embedding and position encoding is exactly here, right? So there were, there were, those are the where the dropouts are applied. And then also um, summation of word embedding and, uh, and then residual connection, what we, we discussed that. And there's also what's called layer normalization. We're gonna discuss this in that next lecture too. So actually next lecture will not be just about decoding strategies, but some um, nuts and bolts about what we might have missed on up to now. And there's some label smoothing, which is really about um, when you're trying to make your model predict the current word, you usually give um, just only you only allow that word to be the true value, but then label smoothing basically allows you to actually um, try to accommodate for what we'll say. Um, well, basically something like this, right? So the in the um, without labels moving, your um, target when you're predicting your word, your target probably distribution will be one hot, right? Because only one word is correct. But if you do perform labor smoothing, it'll be something like this. So it's still, this answer is the highest value, but then you still give some values to other uh, vocab words so that you have some, um, you are, you basically make the model more, um, well, I would say not too, um, I mean, it doesn't give the loss too much on this one word. Okay, and then what was the result with the transformer? Well, it was, actually pretty fascinating, not just on the accuracy, but also on the training cost. So back then, most models were either um, RNNs or convolutional neural network based, where RNNs were actually, um, at this time, were actually not worse than the convolutional neural net, but then still, um, they were pretty good with accuracy of 26.03 and 40.56, right? And then, there came the convolutional, convolutional uh, neural network based machine translation model, which was something like 26.36 and 41.29. So there was about of a 0.33 improvement and um, I'll say 0 0.7 improvement. And, but then really the good thing about convolutional net was the fact that um, I mean, not good, but then the bad thing about it was that the, um, the training cost was much higher, right? Because um, if you compare this to like 10 times and there is like about what, three times or four times. And then now came the transformer, which is not only uh, better than the um, convolution neural net by like two points here and also here, um, 0.5, but then you also see that the, the um, even you're comparing with the big model here, your time complexity or the training cost is like 100 or 150th, right? It's like magnitude of order smaller than convolution neural net. And even it's even smaller than the um, LSTM, which is um, like, five times smaller. So your training cost decreased, your accuracy increased by a lot. So it was pretty clear after a few um, months, the transformer was released and there were some modifications to the paper that transformer is really um, replacing RNNs and CNNs in um, language domain. So I actually highly advise you to take a look at this note. Um, well, actually, um, recommend you to look at it before, well, not necessarily next lecture, but we could actually, if you look at it before next lecture, it's very uh, annotated notebook of the transformer as to what the title says. So uh, what I talked about, it's more of a mathematical explanations than the code, what, code level explanations, right? And if you look at this, uh, note now, then you will see how it connects to the code within the um, 
uh, within um, how, how it connects the code um, to implement transformer. And assignment three will be based on this notebook. There will be also some math questions, so it will be good to read it anyways. And in the next lecture, I'll be talking about language model, and then also I'll be discussing some nuts and bolts in decoding and also some um, regularization techniques like layer norm and batch norm that was also used in the um, transformer. So thanks a lot. That's it for today. And I'll meet TAs on the Google Meet link. So please come to the Google Meet for the TAs. Thanks.